Traceability needs to exist between levels within the requirements hierarchy. Recall that in the material we introduced the concept of traceability by using an example of a sustainability requirement leading to requirements for rainwater tanks and a solar power system. Recall from earlier in the MOOC we also explained that traceability needs to exist in two directions from the higher level requirements to the lower level requirements and from the lower level requirements back to the higher level requirements. We describe this traceability as being forward and backward traceability respectively. Develop three system level requirements for our house project and then explain how these requirements will influence subsystem requirements. In doing so, explain traceability and explain why it's so important to the systems engineering process. Your answer should have included three system level requirements for a house that led to lower level requirements. You could choose almost any example of higher level requirements leading to lower level requirements in this exercise. I hope you saw a few interesting examples that other people came up with as well. You might for example choose a requirement like security at the system level where the house might need to prevent intruders from stealing or damaging our belongings. This upper level requirement might end up influencing the selection of our doors and windows, the functionality of an integrated security system and the functionality of our electrical subsystem in the form of sensor lights and floodlights. You might have chosen an upper level requirement associated with keeping occupants cool in the summer months, leading to influences such as insulation requirements, air conditioning requirements and window and ventilation requirements. Or you might have chosen a requirement associated with being able to cope with torrential rainfall that resulted in influences such as stormwater and drainage requirements, roof design requirements and excavation requirements. As for the reason why we're interested in influence and traceability, forward traceability from higher level requirements to lower level requirements helps demonstrate that all of the higher level requirements are being addressed somehow by the lower level design. That is, we need to be able to show that all of the higher level requirements have made their influence felt on the lower level requirements. When answering the question about backward traceability, you should have mentioned scope creep or words to that effect because traceability in the backward direction helps ensure that the requirements have a reason for existing. That is, the requirement is there to serve a purpose that's associated with some higher level requirement. Requirements that do not serve a higher level requirement may be evidence of scope creep. Just before we leave traceability, the concept of requirements creep is something that I'm interested in. I've watched a movie called The Pentagon Wars quite a few times. It's an interesting movie from a systems engineering perspective and it centres around the development of an armoured vehicle called the Bradley Fighting Vehicle. If you get the chance, you might want to have a look at that movie. It's based on a book of the same title by a guy called James Burton. The book is broader than just the Bradley and it's also worth reading if you get the chance. We spoke about the options available to us when making design decisions. Broadly speaking, we can make use of off-the-shelf technologies or products in our design, or we can go down some form of developmental path. The developmental path may see us selecting off-the-shelf technology and then modifying it to meet our requirements, or we might be designing solutions from first principles. We called the latter approach a developmental approach. Each of these approaches comes with advantages and disadvantages that must be considered before making decisions. Develop a table explaining the potential benefits and potential downfalls associated with using off-the-shelf versus modified versus developmental technology in your design. Your answer should include advantages and disadvantages for each approach and capture these sorts of main points. Firstly, off-the-shelf technology or products, let's start with the potential advantages. Off-the-shelf technology is a known quantity. The claimed function and performance of off-the-shelf technology represents actual function and performance, not a projection of possible function and performance. If required, we could get the technology and prove that it does exactly what the specification says it can do to the specified levels of performance. This contrasts starkly with the developmental approach. 
Off-the-shelf technology will also tend to be available with known lead times or, in fact, immediately available, hence the term off-the-shelf. The costs associated with off-the-shelf technology will also be known. Off-the-shelf technology will probably come with some form of warranty provision, so if it breaks or fails, it can be replaced. And off-the-shelf technology probably also has maintenance and support provisions in place so that we don't have to worry about maintenance, spares, test equipment, training, and so on. The main disadvantages of off-the-shelf technology include a lack of control over the technology, including things like changes, upgrades, and obsolescence. People can make decisions about the technology and its future without consulting us. Also, the potential lack of engineering data and information of the technology makes integration and engineering potentially difficult. Imperfect form, fit or function might mean that the technology might be close to what we want, but not perfect. The technology also might lack formal qualification. So we might need to formally qualify the technology or the product in our specific environment. For example, using commercial technology in a military environment can be problematic. Let's have a look at developmental technology. Let's start with the potential advantages. The main advantage of developmental technology is that it has the potential to perfectly meet our requirements because we're designing and building it specifically to meet those requirements. Unfortunately, there are a bunch of potential pitfalls to watch out for as well. Firstly, even though we try to design something to be perfect, it may fall short. It will probably take a considerable time and a considerable sum of money to design and build something from scratch compared to buying it off the shelf. We will also have to establish the production capability and all of the logistics support elements, such as spares, test equipment, tooling, training and so on. We will also have to test and qualify the product in the environments for which it's been designed. Note that test and evaluation is time consuming and costly and can therefore only be justified if we're going to build a large number of these items. Finally, what about modifying off-the-shelf technology? Let's start with potential advantages. Modified off-the-shelf technology is kind of middle of the road in terms of pros and cons. So have a look at the advantages of off-the-shelf and the advantages of developmental and you'll get a bit of an idea. You could end up with something that's pretty close to perfect and has all the advantages of off-the-shelf technology. Unfortunately, there's some bad news. By modifying a commercial item, you probably invalidate the support agreements and the warranty agreements that came with that off-the-shelf item. You'll probably need to establish production, maintenance and support for the elements of the design that you're modifying. You may have some trouble sourcing the engineering data for the off-the-shelf item that you need in order to design and implement the modification. And in my experience, people generally grossly underestimate the time and money associated with the modification and grossly overestimate how effective the modified item will be in meeting their requirements.